Welcome to another episode of This Catholic Life. Conversations about life's ups and downs, big and small, how we do with every situation imaginable, whatever life throws at us, but still manage to be sensible, practical, and joyful. Today's show is about one of those situations that got thrown both at myself and my guest, and that is that we were, in fact, clergy in another Christian group and became Catholics. And so, Clergy's Converting is the theme of this week's podcast, a conversation about the pitfalls of conversion, not so much about the reasons, that's another story for another time, but just the the kind of ways in which it's difficult culturally, sometimes in practical ways, and the ways in which we're trying to help people um, who choose to become Catholic with a new organisation called the St Andrews Network. I'm your host, Peter Holmes, and today I'm joined by Nigel Zimmerman, who is a co-founder of the St. Andrews Network here in Australia. Welcome, Nigel. Thanks so much, Peter. Before we get started, just a reminder to listeners that if you like the show, you should subscribe on your podcast app, and that way you won't miss anything. So let's first define what we're talking about. And Nigel, you were, in fact, a, a minister, I guess they call it a priest in the Anglican Church. That's right, Peter. My, my upbringing was actually in the Baptist Church. Uh, in a small evangelical community, and then I found my way into the Anglican context, ended up uh, being ordained as an Anglican priest. Um, So I was serving uh, and ministering in an Anglican church in the Scottish Highlands, which is known as the Scottish Episcopal Church there, of course, when my wife and I uh, came to the decision to become Catholic. That's a, and it's a, obviously there's a journey behind that and there's, there's a whole lot of reasons which we can talk about some other time. But the actual, once you've made the decision, now I should be clear to the listener, I too, um, I was actually raised in the evangelical tradition, uh, became a Lutheran as a young, very young adult, I think at 19 or 20, and after a little while was a, a minister in the Lutheran church, a pastor as they call them there. I served for a very brief time as a pastor in the Lutheran church, um, only a couple of years before um, coming to the decision that I needed to join um, to be received into the Catholic Church, if they'd have me, and uh, I was received back in 2001. Now, once that decision's been made, this is the question we're talking about right today, once that decision's been made, it's a big deal because you're in a situation where you have qualifications to be a Protestant pastor or minister or priest. You're generally speaking, um, you've, you've declared that you're not uh, going to do that anymore and you want to become a Catholic. Catholics now look at you with a little bit of wariness. <laughs> they're, they're generally nice to us, uh, wouldn't you say, Nige? Uh, absolutely. Look, generally people are welcoming, <laughs> but they do look at you like you're yes, the, yes. the strange bird in the cage, you know, where have you come from? Yes. And, and I mean, in fairness, if a Catholic is going to be looking to employ someone or trust someone in a particular um, ministry, they generally speaking don't look for someone with qualifications from a Protestant um, seminary or a Protestant, <laughs> Protestant theological college because, you know, there's a difference. There's a difference in the way we go about these things. But when you've made that decision, um, if you're a minister, you don't tend to just frivolously make these decisions to become Catholic. I'm not saying anyone else is frivolous. I'm just simply saying usually it takes quite a lot of conviction to leave something that you've trained for and you have a solid job and all of your friends and family are part of. It's quite a big call to become a Catholic. You're reasonably certain about it when you do it. Um, Would you say that's fair? Look, absolutely. And for every individual who makes that journey, they've had to go through a series of, you know, questions around personal faith, their own commitment There might be doctrinal hurdles. They've got to think their way through. So it's something of a struggle. And when they finally land on that decision um, that this is actually where I feel called to be and I'm going to make my way out of one community and one tradition into the great sort of broadness and the depth of the Catholic tradition and the Catholic Church, um, at one level you're coming home, at another you're coming into such a different environment and there's all sorts of personal questions beyond theology. And that, as you say, that's a whole other conversation, but you actually encounter a different culture. Um, so it takes a lot of adjustment and there's yes. a lot of questions that come up for you along the way. There's a lot of things that, that uh, Protestants and Catholics say 
they say the same words, they use the same formulas, they use the same kinds of um, descriptions of things, but often in practical terms, it looks very different. And so when we describe church, for example, we use very similar descriptions. I, I wouldn't have said that my Lutheran ecclesiology is a lot different to Catholic ecclesiology. In fact, I was often accused as a Lutheran of being, um, well, actually, we proudly called ourselves evangelical Catholics. We try to claim the, <laughs> the idea that we're, in fact, a branch of Catholicism. Uh, I even attempted to write my own Tract 90, the, the, the Newman thing, of trying to justify Lutheran church as a Catholic church. But when you become Catholic, they just do church differently, if I can put it as crassly as that. When you show up to a Catholic mass, it's a different experience than a Protestant church. What would you say are the main differences you notice right off the bat, Nigel? Look, I, I'd break it down to two kinds of things. You, you've got your odd quirks and habits and ways of talking that come up. But then you've got um, the kind of cultural assumptions that go on. Um, I'll give you an example of one of the quirks. In the very earliest days of my encounter with Catholic worship and Catholic churches, and I, I was just at the beginning of trying to get my head around what on earth Catholics think they're doing when they go to church, I, I remember walking in and seeing people walk in and genuflect. The problem was that as they walked into church, they did a kind of swivel, so they genuflected as they were getting to their <laughs> pew. So for the first six months, I actually thought people were genuflecting to the chairs, and it, it took some time. <laughs> it took some time for me to really grasp that, no, 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 they're, they're genuflecting, uh, you know, to the real presence, the, the blessed sacrament. Um, it's just that this is a habit as well as sort of an honoured tradition, and, and, it, and habits can become yeah. a little bit more quirky and, and lazy. Yeah. It's like talking. If, you, if, if you're talking and you slur your words, sometimes they're misunderstood. Yeah, exactly. So if you kind of slur the habits, if you, you fudge the habits, then they get misunderstood. Yeah, I, I think that's right. And, but look, in terms of the broader culture, you know, once you begin to immerse yourself in, and if you've come to that, that, it, that decision to become Catholic, you probably arrive with some enthusiasm and, and some real sort of heartache to throw yourself into it and really immerse yourself in it. And, and it's because you've, you've basically fallen in love. You know, you've fallen in love with something and you've got some passion for the, the Catholic faith and you're, you're trying to learn more and understand more. And also, if you're a minister, your whole life has been wrapped up in that, in that world and your whole life has been committed to religious activity, if you like, and, and you're used to your whole week being full of this and your mind being full of this and your heart being full of this. And when you come to the church, you, you, you're perhaps not as casual about it as other people might be. You tend to sort of throw yourself at everything and try and fill your heart and mind and, and week, <laughs> your, your practical Ab week absolutely. with these things. Absolutely. And, and it's a bit of the difference between the married couple in their first two or three years and the married couple after 30 years. Um, in, in both cases, you might find a love that is deep and real. It's just that after 30 years, you've also got some habits of trust and communication that have just been built in. So for the clergy convert, you know, you, you've been used to being up in the pulpit yourself and trying to lead a community, and then you become Catholic. And and, and you find that people just seem a little bit more casual about the faith, a bit more relaxed, um, and sometimes they don't all take things as seriously as you'd like. And that's where you, you have... Particular yeah, things. Yeah, well, you know, there's, there's all sorts of things. One of them is, is the most obvious one that hits you um, is probably liturgically, largely because, you know, when you become Catholic, you have to start immersing yourself in usually in a parish context sunday mass and so there might there might be elements of that that you've fallen in love with that catholics around you just take for granted you might have come from a much more strongly yep. singing tradition and certainly as someone who came from a baptist and an anglican yes. context where we sung our hearts out on sunday Yes, it feels it feels kind of weird going into the average parish. <laughs> yeah. Here, doesn't it? Yeah, it does. doesn't sing very well. well. It's funny. One of my Lutheran colleagues once accused me of running away from the Lutheran Church because I was 
I was looking for the perfect world. I was looking for the perfect church. And I was, I shouldn't give up on Lutherans just because they're a little bit imperfect. And he thought I was going to the Catholics to look for some kind of utopia. And I, I remember saying to him, look, if I came here looking for the perfect Bible studies or the or the wonderful singing or the great liturgies or the or the amazing uh, preaching, then I'd come to the wrong place because in all of those ways, there were better examples in the Lutheran church that I had come across. I didn't do it for any of those reasons. I did it because it was true. And in fact, that's almost the only reason because I hadn't met any Catholics before I became Catholic. I'd met one or two, I think, and spoken to them. And it was mostly reading that got me into the church. I'd have to say, Nigel, just the physical experience comes down to, in a Protestant world, everything's about that Sunday when they everyone gets together, either or maybe on a Wednesday night during Lent or something. But the Sunday experience was so intense. You got together socially. You got to you worshipped. You sang. You had lunch together. You you did Bible studies, and during the week you'd still meet the same people. But it was very intense, and it was very local. Uh, even though we talked about missions, we talked about other things. It was still very focused on the local church. Now that sounds very good for a Catholic, and they they often look at jealously at Protestant parishes and go, "Wow, aren't they really lively?" Yes, but it's so one placed that um, if something, if a relationship goes sour there, or if there's some kind of tension, or if it's not really your ministry, then it can be an alienating experience, even in that intensity. Whereas in the Catholic Church. <laughs> I went to my first mass and I was looking forward to meeting people after mass and catching up with the locals. And honestly, I had to check my deodorant because the instant the last blessing was spoken, uh, you couldn't see people for dust. They were gone. Um, it, it was just a very different experience. And I, I couldn't help thinking, is there any community? Do they even have a community? And I, I just didn't, I think that the community of the Catholic Church is spread so widely they do it in all sorts of other aspects of their life that it takes some getting used to and, and you need some help, you need guides to help you that's, find them. That's a great example. And, you know, in a Catholic parish is so different from your average Protestant church community because your average Catholic parish is not a single community. It's a whole bunch of communities and they're kind of all sitting alongside and on top of each other. So you might have a particular devotional group that meets at 9.15 You'll have a particular language mass that then ha has gathers for 10. Um, you might have a priest who is stretched between three or four church locations and, and is just, you know, working his heart out um, every day of the week without a lot of rest. Um, and you've got those in the community who need some special needs or care. And then you've got those who are just really keen to, to get together and form a cricket club, you know. So you've got a whole range of different groups and they don't always stop and know each other or talk to one another. Sometimes you do, sometimes you don't. But when you walk in as, as an ex-clergy, you know, sort of member or an ex-sort of minister from another community, that's actually quite bewildering. It, it's, it's a little bit like turning up to a basketball game if you've only ever played golf, you know. It takes a lot of getting used to. <laughs> I like that analogy. <laughs> it is. It is a bit like that. And the things. The thing is, is you, I think you'd need to change um, your analogy there to have two similar sports because quite often you'll think you're going along with something that's quite similar. Like the the mass isn't isn't a lot different to the Lutheran liturgy, for example. Mm -hmm. You'll be going along in a very similar pattern, and then suddenly you'll hit something that's quite different, quite distinct. And, and you'll catch yourself out saying it the wrong way or, or you realise, gosh, that's a reflection of this theology. I remember we went to our first Catholic wedding and I was struck by how similar it was until you got to the question where they asked, will you receive children from God? And I realised there was simply no emphasis on children at all in the, the Lutheran liturgy and it was very much a Protestant versus Catholic thing. Um, the openness to life was expressed mm -hmm. liturgically in that case. Another thing I noticed um, was that when we announced that we were having our third child, we'd just become Catholic. It was only about a year or less than a year. And all of our Protestant friends, to a man, no matter what their particular theological bent, all said, why? Or have you thought about the consequences kind of thing? All our Catholic friends, from the most liberal to the most conservative, all said, congratulations, that's wonderful. 
there was a kind of a, a genuine joy they shared in the expansion of a family. And, and that struck me as this isn't a conservative versus liberal thing. This isn't anything. It's actually mm. a cultural thing. There's a, there's a big cultural change in, in when moving across. I don't know about you, though, but that things like relics just flipped me <laughs> out like i just i didn't know what to do with them <laughs> just someone's talking about oh here comes saint Teresa of you really in that box yeah no it's her arm you sorry you've got someone's arm in a box yeah what look, are you funny, doing <laughs> when you're an ex especially from a protestant background you know you everybody has their particular um sort of quirk or cultural expression in the catholic church that was one of the last things for them to get over it's funny you mention relics. Um, relics is a pretty common one. Um, often, I think often ministers from other churches think it's going to be something like uh, the role of Mary. So you, you dive deeply into that and then you discover, oh, gee, Catholics actually view Mary primarily as their friend in a way, you know, the, the one who is there to comfort and support yes. them. And also, mind you, that's such an obvious distinction between Catholics and Protestants that I think most people who are considering the jump to Catholicism have already worked that one through intellectually. Like, I think you know you can't you can't miss the fact that Catholics think differently about Mary. Yeah, it's not something that's 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 hard to see, um, and so you tend to have thought that through. One of the things that comes up, Nigel, is that. Ministers in particular come across lots of hardships, which perhaps others don't. Um, not that they don't, but that it's less pronounced in other journeys. And I want to talk a little bit about this this uh, network that we're talking about here, the St. Andrews Network, which is the, in the United States, you have the, the Coming Home Network, which is an organisation to assist Protestant ministers becoming Catholic. And in Great Britain, um, what's the one in Great Britain called again? Uh, the St. Barnabas Society. The St. Barnabas Society, which again is very specifically geared to assisting um, both culturally, pastorally, and and practically um, ministers who have made the decision. Now, none of neither of these organisations go out of their way to go and hunt people down and try and win converts. It's merely a, a practical assistance to those who have made the decision to to take those steps. I don't know about you, but when I became Catholic, there was a serious financial question. I had a young family to feed and what do you do? You know, they don't, you have a couple of theology degrees that doesn't qualify you to be a used car salesman or a politician or <laughs> any of those things. Mm. So what do you do? Um, that's a very real question for a young, uh, young minister or someone who's working in the church. Um, what, what can I do practically that will just simply help me survive? Look, just practically, you're right. And if you look at the demographics of ministers from other traditions, largely you're talking about men and most of whom have a family. And in the vast majority of those cases, they are the single earner for their family. So they're in a single income family in which they've trusted and they've put a lot of faith in their church to support them. So whether it's their, you know, their particular congregation or a diocese or, or something in another tradition like Anglicanism or Lutheranism or something, that's how they've gotten by. And they've taken huge risks in their personal life to do that. They've made sacrifice. Um, they've put aside prospects of another kind of career or, or job um, to become a minister of the gospel in whatever way. Then when they become Catholic, um, not surprisingly, the, their, their spouse and their family are saying, well, what the heck does this mean for us? Um, how are we going to yes. get by? You know, if you become Catholic, you don't walk into a job, you, you leave a job behind. Um, and it just struck me and that... And it's, it's, it's... Yeah, it, it just struck me this is something that we can help and support. Say, it's, broader than, it's broader than that. It's very much so, but it's broader than that, Nigel, in the sense that... Um, Often in the States, they, the surveys they took in the States say about half the men who became Catholic who, when they were ministers, their wives divorced them because it's not just about money. It's also about community. It's about the, you know, the, the families and the colleagues you used to have and all the friends you had and the networks and the support structures, everything you relied on financially and, and physically and socially. All of these people take it personally and understandably because 
it's a very deeply personal thing. If you say the Catholic Church is right, then that that's a challenge to anybody who doesn't share the same belief. Um, and it's not enough for me to say, well, that's my personal decision. If I've decided my orders aren't valid and I need to be Catholic, then that's a challenge to anyone else who's in those orders, um, you know, <laughs> who's in that situation. So I was cut off and I, there are some of my dearest friends from those days who haven't spoken to me since the day that I announced I was becoming Catholic. And that social isolation can be every bit as, as awful as, as the, the financial consequences and all those sorts of other things. Um, and the kind of brotherhood and, and sisterhood you need in the faith it suddenly becomes devoid and, and you're looking for something. So uh, the St Andrews Network in Australia is trying to pitch this to an Australian audience in, for the Australian needs, being realistic about what we can actually, you know, we're not, we're not funded by millionaires. Um, <laughs> it's very much a peer-to-peer -peer kind of organisation, but it's an attempt to, to provide the contact points for people um, who've perhaps taken the journey before to help others who've come through. I think that's more or less what we're trying to achieve with it. But uh, have I missed something there, Nigel? Look, look, no, that's absolutely right. In in this network, I've taken great inspiration from St. Andrew. Um, St. Andrew, you know, was brother and friend to Peter. And in John's Gospel, we have this great, beautiful story of him bringing his brother to the Lord. And 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 out of that, great, great fruitfulness and, and some wonderful things have happened of the church and it, it, it's very beginning um, for those who we want to support you know we won't we won't necessarily be able to link people with um, a new context in which we can land them a livelihood and a job and give security necessarily what i'd like to be able to do though is offer a network so that confidential conversations are available they know that they've got a group of people who have made the journey themselves and they can just have a yarn and talk it through. Um, if there's some deep theological questions to work through, we can work through that with them. If there are just simple... Uh, we can also be a translator. Often there's the, when Protestants are using certain language and Catholics are using different language, you, you, get, uh, you need a translator to help us understand each other. Because sometimes, I remember when I was first a Catholic, I needed someone to explain what they meant by a particular word, like even original sin, things like that, confession, they all mean different, slightly different things. Yeah, exactly. Well, I mean, with that aim clearly stated, uh, we're probably short of time for this conversation. But if you're out there listening to this podcast, I would say um, just be patient with somebody who has become Catholic. They don't have to be clergy, but it tends to be most prominent in clergy. But if someone in an in evangelical community or perhaps even Mormons or others have had an experience of intense ecclesial community and then they suddenly become Catholic, there is a certain transition of culture and of of language and that, that they need patient friends. And what they don't need is people yelling at them because they don't understand the devotion to St. Bidolonia of, I don't know, something. <laughs> they, need, they need patience and gentle introduction to the faith. And hopefully now there's a network in Australia but that you can look for that kind of translation and help um, uh, in terms of finding community. But that's enough for this week's podcast. If today's discussion got you thinking or arguing, or if you'd like to help out in some way, uh, even if it's just uh, asking how you can help your local uh, people out, uh, do get in contact with the St. Andrews Network. We'll put a link in the podcast uh, notes, uh, but also you can look for it online uh, or check us out at thiscatholiclife.com.au and we'll put you onto them. Remember that this is a uniquely Australian Catholic podcast, so we're talking about Australian issues for the Catholic world and our life, uh, we think that's an idea worth getting behind, so tell your friends. But until next week, that's all for now. Thank you for listening to This Catholic Life.